had been talking about John Wesley um, as he was at Christ Church, Christ Church, of course, Oxford. Um, and Wesley had several friends. He had several friends at Christ Church with whom he often uh, took meals. Uh, his youthful manner was easy and light, uh, marked by a taste for conversation and for the diversions of the day. Like many other students at Oxford, Wesley <coughs> excuse me, frequented the coffee house. He rode on the river uh, and played backgammon, billiards, chess, cards, and tennis. And on rare occasions when his financial resources permitted, uh, he would attend the theater. So here was a young man, in other words, who was obviously enjoying his youth, who was exploring an array of activities with a sense of wonder and ease. The seriousness and meticulous use of time so characteristic of the mature Wesley is something that's going to come later. Indeed, it will take reading Jeremy Taylor's book, Rules of Holy Living and Holy Dying, uh, shortly after his residence at Christ Church, among other things, uh, to precipitate this change. In other words, whereby Wesley becomes more serious. And yet elements of that later seriousness, especially in the area of religion, were present even during this early period. Okay, <clears throat> so we see uh, some evidence of that even at Oxford. Wesley uh, is becoming more and more serious, religiously speaking. Now, one way to assess this is to look at some of the correspondence, some of the letters uh, that flowed back and forth between John Wesley and his parents. <clears throat> and we see that the correspondence <clears throat> at, the, uh, at the time when Wesley was 22 years old uh, reveal a growing seriousness on John Wesley's part and the recognition first by Susanna, then later by Samuel, that their son John was suited for Anglican ordination. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and so it was Susanna who actually raised this issue for the first time, quote, this is what she wrote, I heartily wish you, meaning John Wesley, I heartily wish you were in orders uh, and could come and serve one of his, meaning Samuel Sr.'s, one of his churches. And so what Susanna is asking there, expressing there, she's hoping that her son will enter into Anglican orders, ordination, and then help assist his father, Samuel uh, senior in terms of the oversight of the parishes. I should mention that um, there was not only the parish at Epworth, <clears throat> but there was also a small parish given to him, given to Samuel <clears throat> at Root. Uh, this was also another church uh, for which he was responsible, and obviously he would receive some money from that so it would ease the financial situation somewhat, okay? And so Susanna's requesting her son, perhaps you should go in orders, you can help your father in terms of Epworth and Root. Um, when Samuel first learned of what John and Susanna had in mind, in other words, his ordination, uh, Samuel was immediately opposed. He was opposed, and he sent his son this word of caution. Quote, by all this you'll see I'm not for your going over hastily into orders. When I'm for your taking them, you shall know it. End of quote. 
Well, so Samuel is opposed to John Wesley going in this direction. And so Susanna writes in a letter, this is what she writes, she confides to her son uh, in February 1725. This is what she writes, quote, "'Tis an unhappiness almost peculiar to our family that your father and I seldom think alike. I approve the disposition of your mind. I think the season of Lent the most proper for your preparation for orders." End of quote. So once again, we have a difference between Samuel Sr. and Susanna. Susanna is in favor of John Wesley's ordination. Samuel at least at this point, is opposed. He's opposed. But as you know, Samuel Sr. can change his mind, uh, which he does. Uh, by the next month, uh, Samuel changed his mind. We don't exactly know the reason why, but he changed his mind uh, and supported uh, John Wesley uh, entering into Anglican orders. And he wrote him as such, and he promised that he would gather up some money for his son's orders and quote, quote, something more, okay? Uh, and so John Wesley is going to enter into the Anglican church, or Anglican orders, will first be ordained deacon and then later be ordained a priest. This is a very important period of time in John Wesley's life, in other words, the year, 1725, it's very important. Uh, this, is, this is a time when he's 22 years old and when he encounters, <coughs> excuse me, whom he calls a religious friend. He encounters a religious friend. What is a religious friend? Well, that is someone who helped him to alter, to change, the whole form of his conversation, or we might say the whole form of his life. To set in earnest upon a new life, Wesley writes. Now, we're not exactly sure who this religious friend was, but whoever it was, and we're gonna suggest two people, one a man, one a woman, that this person, whoever it was, had a significant impact, had a significant impact on the life of John Wesley. One clue to this puzzle uh, can perhaps be found in Wesley's habit of visiting the, rector, the rectory at Stanton where he was friendly with Sally Kirkham. Sally Kirkham, who was the rector's daughter. Um, so she might have been this religious friend who helped him to alter his conversation, his whole form of life. That's a possibility. Uh, but another case could be made for Robin Griffiths. Robin Griffiths, who is a man, uh, the son of the Reverend John Griffiths of Broadway in the Cotswold Hills, uh, at any rate, Whoever this religious friend was, and, and we don't know for sure, uh, whoever it was, this person helped John Wesley to see the importance, the importance of what? The importance of inward holiness, which is the goal of religion, and it's for this goal that John Wesley prays. He prays for this. Now, the year 1725 is also important beyond meeting this religious friend, but Wesley's also reading some books that are going to have a great impact upon his thinking, his life and his thought. And one of the books that he reads, uh, it's a religious classic and you, you are familiar with it, you've heard of it of course, and it's called, the title is The Imitation of Christ. The Imitation of Christ by, supposedly by Thomas a. Kempis, uh, who was a member of the Brethren of Common Life uh, during the 15th century. Uh, Wesley reads this work and it has a great effect upon him. Has a great effect upon him. Um, 
And so he writes to his mother. Notice he's turning to his mother, Susanna, when he has questions about practical divinity, practical Christian living. He writes to his mother. Um, and uh, he talks about in the letter the harshness, the harshness of the imitation of Christ, some of its teachings, some of its teachings. And so this is what Wesley writes later on, quote, I met with Kempis's, meaning Thomas A. Kempis, I met with his Christian pattern. That's just another name for imitation of Christ. I met with Kempis's Christian pattern, the nature and extent of inward religion, the religion of the heart, now appeared to me in a stronger light than ever it had done before. I saw that giving all my life to God, supposing it possible to do this and go no further, would profit me nothing, Wesley writes, unless I gave my heart, yea, all my heart to him. That's quite, uh, quite a writing, quite a statement that Wesley makes here after reading Thomas a. Kempis's uh, imitation, imitation of Christ. Um, how many of you here have read The Imitation of Christ? Uh, okay, maybe a couple. Um, it's a very important spiritual classic. It's in print today, has sold millions of copies, of course. The good thing and the very valuable thing, I think, for The Imitation of Christ even today is that The Imitation talks about being faithful being faithful to Jesus Christ day in and day out in periods of consolation, where perhaps it may be easy to do so, but also in periods of desolation. In other words, when things are not going well, uh, things are going badly, actually, and to remain faithful and not to skip a beat. And that may have something to do with Wesley referring to it as harsh at times, but uh, uh, the imitation of Christ is trying to strengthen Christian maturity. It is Christian maturity. The baby Christian, they experience suffering or desolation or pain, and oh, oh God, take it away, right away, take it away, immediately, immediately. Uh, and th that's what they want. That's all they can see. Whereas the mature Christian, like Paul, uh, can be faithful in times of consolation and also in times of desolation and not miss a beat. That ever faithful, ever faithful, uh, faithfully in Christ. So it's in a very important work. And Wesley, in reading this book, The Imitation of Christ, sees the nature and extent of inward religion for the first time. He sees it very clearly. In other words, he sees the importance, as Susanna was teaching her children early on, sees the importance of giving the heart, giving the will uh, to God. Uh, and he sees also the beauty of simplicity of intention. Um, and so this is a very, a very important book. Um, in one sense, Wesley is seeing the end or goal of religion. What's the end or goal of religion? It's holiness. It's holiness, or we can say holy love. It is holy love. Um, that would be another way of expressing it. And Wesley's understanding the point of it all, what's the goal or the end of the Christian faith, when he's a young, a young man, he's, he's 22 years old. Reading our campus, he understands the importance of inward religion, the importance of holiness or holy love. Then about the same time that Wesley was reading our campus, He's also becoming acquainted with the writings of Jeremy Taylor. Jeremy Taylor was an Anglican. He was a 17th century Anglican divine. Uh, he's often referred to as a Caroline divine from the 17th century. Wrote uh, a very important work, 
rule and exercises of holy living and holy dying. Okay, what a title, huh? Rule and exercises of holy living and holy dying. Uh, I don't know about your culture here uh, in Estonia, but I know back in North America, uh, we rarely talk about holy dying. We talk a lot about holy living, uh, if we can get that conversation going, but we don't talk about holy dying, which is something that uh, Jeremy Taylor did in the 17th century and something John Wesley will do in the 18th century and subsequent Methodists will do as well. In other words, that Christians not only live a certain way, they die a certain way. They die differently than others. Their living as well as their dying is to the glory of God. It is a way of witnessing to the love of God being manifested uh, in our lives and in our death. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God neither life nor death nor things present nor things to come nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God manifested in Christ Jesus our Lord. There are books written by Methodists on this topic. They died well. They died well, not in anxious fear. Oh, I'm afraid to die. I'm afraid of judgment and guilt and condemnation and hell. There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. And so here you see with the Christian message, message, as Paul said, not simply words, but power. Power to live faithfully in both the good and the bad, and power to die in serenity, glorifying God. On John Wesley's deathbed, when he was in 1791, what is he doing? Is he afraid to die? No. What is he doing? He's actually quoting a hymn from Isaac Watts. I'll praise my maker while I've breath. I'll praise, I'll praise. He's glorifying God as he knows he's dying. He's thanking God for the graces received, for the love enjoyed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Christians die well. Holy living, to be sure, but also holy dying. Holy dying. And we'll talk more about this as we get deeper uh, into Wesley's, Wesley's journey here. Okay? So, in reading Jeremy Taylor's book, Wesley sees that this too, like our campus, is very serious. Uh, and it focuses on practical Christian living. Uh, and so in Jeremy Taylor's writings, Wesley sees again, but in a slightly different way, uh, the importance of purity of intention, that our intentions uh, must be pure, as well as dedication to God, uh, an entire devotion to God. And so Wesley writes after reading uh, this book by Jeremy Tell, this is what Wesley writes, quote, I was exceedingly affected. That part in particular which relates to purity of intention. Instantly I resolved to dedicate all my life to God, all my thoughts and words and actions. And so we see, we see here in Wesley's quote that in this context, he's understanding the Christian life, the Christian life as devotion, as an entire dedication and consecration to the will, to the will of God. 
Uh, so this period of 1725, this year of 1725, is very important for John Wesley. He encounters a religious friend who sets him on a new course in life. He's reading Thomas A. Kempis, The Imitation of Christ, which helps him to see the end or goal of religion, which is holiness. And then he's reading Jeremy Taylor, uh, which is showing him the importance of devotion and entire consecration. And so we can call this period, we can call this period or this year of 1725, it, the time of Wesley's spiritual awakening. Yes, spiritual awakening. That he is awakened in a deeper way to the things of God. Uh, he is coming to understand the invisible world, the world of the unseen more clearly. Uh, he is beginning to perceive through faith uh, eternity. Uh, eternity, those things that are unseen, that are invisible. He's gaining a new appreciation uh, for this. And so uh, I think it is fit to say that this is the time of his spiritual awakening when he understood for the first time what is the end or goal of religion, which is holiness or holy love. He realized that religion entailed not simply outward exercise or duty, but also religion must affect the, the tempers and dispositions of the heart. That religion must transform us within. It must transform us within. Uh, that it is not simply a, a matter of outward, but also inward. It must be inward uh, as well. Uh, and that, that is so very important, especially in our uh, contemporary contexts. Lots of times we focus on uh, serving the poor, which is good, of course, serving the poor, external works, doing good to our neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. But we must also consider inward religion, that is, the grace of God must transform us in terms of our very will, our dispositions, what we desire, what we give ourselves to. Uh, and Wesley is underscoring that. He's underscoring that. Uh, that faith in Jesus Christ and the grace of God will transform us at the very depths of our being, who we are as a person who we are as a person, okay? I'll express it this way. Uh, and we, we all have souls. I know some people today quibble about souls, but you have one. We all have souls. Uh, and the soul, listen to this now, the soul is 50,000 fathoms deep. Yes, yes. And for some, it's, they're not even aware. They're not even aware of the depth of their own being. But through the grace of God, by faith, and in knowing Jesus Christ, and, and knowing who God is by grace through faith, they will come to understand themselves better. How beautifully they have been created in the image and likeness of God in an embodied soul. And that soul being made up of will and tempers and dispositions that are rightly oriented towards God. Okay? Let me express that in another way. I see in my culture, North American culture, a very, what I call a flat understanding of what a human being is. You know, it's just really not much depth. You know, you get a little psychology, a little up and down, but, but not the kind of depth that we're talking about here, the knowledge and love of God, the knowing ourselves as God knows us, to, to receive the love of God at the depths of our being, whereby we, our hearts, listen to the image, are circumcised. That, that intimate act of cutting, cutting deeply within uh, where our heart is, where our will is, where being transformed 
by God's grace such that everything that comes outward is transformed and changes. Our actions, our thoughts, how we relate to people, okay? But the center, the center is the heart, the soul, the tempers, the will, the disposition. Susanna got it right. And John Wesley is following her here. He is underscoring the importance of inward religion, okay? Now, that doesn't mean outward religion isn't important. Isn't important. It is important. But Wesley is saying it's both and, inward religion, outward religion, both together. I don't know your culture here, but in my culture in North America, we talk all the time about outward religion. We hardly ever talk about inward religion. We, we just don't talk about it. Uh, and so that's going to be a contrast when we look at the theology of John Wesley because he understands the tempers and dispositions of the heart very clearly. All right, let me, let me fill out this one piece so that you understand uh, because there's danger of misunderstanding here. Uh, and so I'm actually going to describe what a disposition is. A disposition. I need to do that because you won't understand how Wesley is describing redemption, what salvation is, if I can't describe a disposition, if you don't know what that means. Okay? So I'm going to contrast a disposition with feelings, with feelings. Okay? And here's how I'm going to do it. We'll start out with the disposition. Okay? Um, what is a disposition? Think of the English word if you can. <laughs> Uh, I am disposed towards something. I am related towards something. I am directed towards something, okay? Uh, related, directed, uh, disposed, desired, wanted. Uh, I'll give you an example to contrast a disposition as opposed to a feeling. Let's say we have a woman uh, she is studying for her doctorate. She's going to do a dissertation on John Wesley. So she's studying with, as the Germans would say, a Dr. Vater, whatever. Um, and uh, this particular professor who's overseeing her dissertation is very hard on her. Very hard, very demanding. You need to do more, more, more. So she comes home Friday night one time. She sits down to dinner with her husband. And at that, at that moment, at that time, she doesn't feel much love towards her husband because she's tired, she's worn out, but she still is related to that man in the same way. She loves that man. That man is her husband. She is related to him. She is disposed towards him in a certain way. And that is ongoing. So dispositions are habituated, they're long-lived, they endure over time. They are not to be confused with feelings. Feelings come and go. Oh, today I feel tired. Oh, tomorrow I feel rested. Oh, I'm feeling happy right now. I'm feeling sad. I mean, that's flux. That, that's just come and go. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a disposition which is an orientation towards God, and our neighbor, they are habituated, they're long-lived, they endure over time, and the grace of God changes our dispositions, what we love, what we give ourselves to, what we're disposed towards, okay? And, and those are some of the great changes that take place in salvation and redemption, that we love what we should love, and we don't love what we shouldn't love. In other words, evil, things that would be wrong for us. We can understand dispositions as making up the will. So salvation, Susanna was right, salvation is very much about the will, about giving our will, surrendering our will to God, being rightly disposed to God. God is what I am aiming at. Oh, that's a good disposition word. God is what I am aiming at in everything I do. Whether I'm drinking a cup of coffee or I'm teaching a class, uh, I am doing everything I do to the glory of God. 
That's my larger purpose. Hey, there's your big picture. There's your big picture. Everything. Everything I do, I do to the glory of God. Why? Because the will has been transformed by grace. I am disposed rightly to God. I love God. God is the center of who I am. And all that I do is done to the knowledge, the love, the glory of God. Okay? So, dispositions are not feelings. Feelings, they come and go. You can have good feelings, bad feelings, you know. They come and go. Dispositions are something different. They're, and dispositions can be both good, they can be bad. So you could be disposed, directed towards what you shouldn't be directed towards. You know, we used that example earlier. I was just watching the movie the other night with my wife, watching the movie um, uh, The Beautiful Boy, which is about addiction. Addiction to... Uh, um, what is it? Uh, what's that substance? It's, um, it's not cocaine, but it's the other one, met methandorphine, met methamphetamine. Yeah, he was addicted to methamphetamine. I mean, that's what the story Beautiful Boy is about. And so as my wife and I were watching this film, we see this person. And, you know, the father, in the father's eyes, he's a beautiful boy. And he is. He's a beautiful person created in the image and likeness of God. Glorious, a soul 50,000 fathoms deep created that way, but directed towards the wrong things. So he's disposed towards methamphetamine, okay? And what does that do? That is the center. And that, that has consequence for everything he does. For his relationships, uh, in relationship to God, to people, to money, to friends, everything. And what does it do? It brings misery in his life because he is not properly directed. He is disposed towards evil, that which, which will destroy what is ultimately valuable, okay? So dispositions can be both good, if we're, if we're rightly oriented to God and neighbor, or they can be evil. We can be disposed towards something that will make us, what? A slave. Watch this. The world out there has it backwards. They think we Christians, oh, we're just weak need people. Oh, we're just struggling along. We're just enslaved in bondage to, you know, a Christian faith. Nonsense. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Christian faith is about liberty. It's about freedom, real freedom. Not the phony kind of freedom that the world talks about that leaves a person twice a slave of self after the reform than before, but no, real liberty, the kind that sets the captive free. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Freedom. Exactly right. Christians are the most free people of all. A slave to nothing. A slave to nothing. In freedom do they surrender their heart and lives to a God of holy love. And the spirit leaves them free. Free to enjoy God and neighbor as we should, as we should, and rightfully so. So, we're getting a little sense of the bigger picture of salvation. We've been talking about holiness. We've been talking about love. We now are talking about freedom, liberty. And that is very much a part of the good news. The good news, it is good news. And so, I know, even among my students at Asbury, when they come, you know, they're just pups. They come in, they're, you know, first year students. And their generation, you know, their generation, they don't respond to issues of guilt. You know, oh, you did this in the past. You should feel guilty about that. You should repent. That doesn't bother them. They, they tell you, eh, if you lived in the home I grew up in, you'd understand why I did those things. You know, so they, they don't even feel guilt. 
when I, when I talk to them sometimes and they tell me what they did and, and things that I'd be in the confessional, you know, for, for weeks in terms, but they feel no guilt. But you know what they understand? They understand bondage. They know what bondage is and they know what slavery is. They know that. And so when someone comes along in the Christian church and says, have faith in Jesus Christ and be free indeed, you have their attention. You have their attention because they know slavery. They know bondage. They're in it. They're in it. And they'll tell you about it with tears. They're in it. They're, they're, they're held tightly. They can't get out. You know, I, I, I want to do well, but I can't. And I keep doing what I don't want to do again and again and again and again, that cycle. That is not the proper Christian faith. That is not real, true, proper Christianity. John Wesley realized that Christ died for more than to leave sinners in the bondages of which they are ashamed. Do you hear me? Okay. And this is precisely where John Wesley's going in this education. Oh, you know, look at him. He's, he's uh, the son of uh, Susanna and, and Samuel. Uh, he was baptized as an Anglican. He goes to church. He says his prayers. He knows it's not enough because he is at this point in bondage. Yeah. He's in the bondage of sin. He sins. He repents. He sins. He repents only to sin again. He's on that spiritual roller coaster ride, which, which some in the church, even in the 18th century, say this is the Christian faith. This is all you can hope for. And Wesley had the good sense to understand that this is not good news. This is not good news to the suffering sinner who not only has to be forgiven their sins, but they have to be transformed in terms of the dispositions of their heart so that they can be free from the power and dominion of sin. Okay? All right. Let's take some questions and comments that you might have. Yes. Oh, let me get my thing on. Yeah, good. В религиозных вопросах он обращался к маме, к родителям. Был ли кто-то еще, вот книги повлияли на него, кто-то еще был духовный наставник его жизни? Okay, in other words, beyond the things that I mentioned uh, that, that led to his, that lead to this spiritual awakening. Um, I, I think beyond that, beyond mentioning the religious friend and then the books that he's reading, I think also we could mention, certainly later on, by the time we get to 1729, um, a fellowship, community of fellowship of fellow Christians, that the effect that that has upon John and Charles Wesley and William Morgan and others, uh, which is actually leading into the rise of Methodism. And so beyond the spiritual friend and beyond the books, it's actually other Christians, uh, other believers, and the context of being in community that has an important uh, effect upon John Wesley. Later on, John Wesley will write, um, Christianity is a social religion, and to turn it into a solitary one is to destroy it. Uh, and so what Wesley is saying by that is that we cannot live the Christian faith alone, that we need each other. We need each other. There are gifts out here uh, that are shared by no one else, but together they can um, 
edify the church. One brings a gift of helps, another brings uh, a gift of teaching, another brings other gifts, but all to benefit the church, edify the church, and all for the glory of God. And so context, social communal context, is very important for, for John Wesley, and it will have consequence upon him. And so in that statement that I just recited to you, Wesley is critical. I hope you notice this. He's critical of a form of monasticism because there was a form of monasticism called hermetic or anchoretic monasticism where the individual would go off alone and be in the desert by themselves, you know, by him or herself. John Wesley is opposed to that. Because in order to live out the Christian faith, we need the community. You cannot live the Christian faith alone. Wesley, Wesley's making a judgment here. He's taking a stand. He's saying, this cannot be done alone. This cannot be done alone. What, what could, would be the danger? Self-deception. Here, here, here's, how, here's how that plays out. Wesley established class meetings and bands, did he not? What was the question that you would be asked each week? What known sins have you committed this week? So you'd have to reveal that to the group, okay? We might want to lie to ourselves. We might want to hide, okay, in, in, in a dark place and um, not come to the light and be revealed. The community keeps us honest. It keeps us free from self-deception, of lying to ourselves, lying to ourselves. Because we know we're going to be in this group, and I know next Wednesday they're going to be asking me, what known sins have you committed this week? So the importance of the community, the group, and the importance of the daily walk, the daily walk, fellowship with God uh, it, throughout the day, a daily walk with God. Yeah, it's a good question, very good question. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Ну, мы вот услышали, что Джон Уэсли столкнулся с тем, что ему не нравилось то состояние, в котором он жил, и постоянно согрешая, каясь, опять согрешая. И ну, это, в принципе, то состояние, которое каждый из нас все уверенно переживал, и то, о чем Павел говорил. Вот. Но вопрос, что Джон Уэсли говорил о том, как вот достичь того расположения своего сердца к Богу, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually your question, a very good one, it shows that you're thinking well, you're thinking well in terms of the content of the course. Um, we are headed there. We're going to answer your question, but we have to put a number of different things in place before we can answer that question. But I promise you, we will answer your question. We're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, it's going to take a little more of Wesley's biography, but when we talk about Aldersgate and John Wesley's Aldersgate experience, we're going to hit your question very, very strongly, very strongly, and it, we will answer it. Um, so, yes, we're, get, we're going there. Yes. Yes, put it on the board for you. Yeah. Disposition. To be disposed, to be oriented, to be directed. Um, it always takes an object. It always takes an object. So 
The temper is taken object. We're always directed at something. We're always desiring something. There's always a value that transcends us that we want, that we give ourselves to. Okay? It could be God. It could be methamphetamine. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>